to whom the question is suggested. Yes, I'm uh, Jack Mormon. Uh, so obviously, I'm a great panel, very knowledgeable about U.S. acquisitions, but for me, the, if you will, elephant in the room, and which you have unfortunately avoided, is if the acquirer is a large Japanese company. I'm interested in if, what, if any of this, applies to Japanese acquisitions. You know, local champions, stock options, uh, the incredibly slow process, a huge amount of due diligence competing with U.S. acquirers which look more favorable, hiring people, if you will, that are in the U.S. or somewhere else, the lack of short, uh, startups in Japan, the list goes on. So. I will say, I mean, if you look at, I just recently looked at a map of acquisitions, 95% of the tech acquisitions are in the U.S., and if I had to do a percentage of that, probably 90% were in this neighborhood. And so I agree that there has to be ways to sort of get outside money in faster, um, and it's all it's a cultural shift. Right, some of it is um, just cross-border deals and sort of localization. Um, I, I don't have a great answer to the challenges, but it, but but I would um, two trends that I'm seeing. One is tech companies are going to start emerging, and, and Silicon Valley is going to start emerging outside of the U.S. I mean, it's not a, it's not a U.S. owned um, right. It's going to we're going to start seeing it in Europe and Asia and, and elsewhere. And the other thing is, um, I think the challenges go both ways because I think. You know, I see U.S. investors trying to get overseas, and they are failing miserably that, too. They just don't know how to operate and adopt a foreign, um, foreign localization rules. And so I think the challenge is the two ways, and I think as you know, us doing business in the U.S. and trying to attract foreign investors here, there's, there's certainly you know, more work to be done. I don't, I don't have a great answer to it, though. Yeah, I think one of the challenges is that you know, the U.S. venture capital model is a portfolio model. You make 10 investments, one or two are hugely successful, one or two fail right away, the rest of the walking dead. And I don't think foreign investors are comfortable with that model. I mean, they want 100% success, or they want a much higher percentage of success. They have people they have to report to, and if they're they must have been a problem with the diligence. No, it's not a problem, it's just the reality. So we hear about all these success stories, but I can give you 150 stories of companies that failed right away. I mean, it just didn't work. They didn't get funded, or they got funded Series A, and the, the, you know, the venture capitalists didn't want to put any more money in, they were done, and they closed their doors. So I mean, that failure rate here in the US is really high too, and the success rate is really high. We're on both extremes, where I think a lot of foreign investors aren't used to those extremes. They just don't want to take that risk for that reward where the U.S. venture capital market is, thrives on that. Can I just, you know, let me just add, add to that too, because you know, it, it, in the long diligence process and the valuation, I think there is probably this thought for, for outside investors to get to the right answer, what's the right value. I mean, if, if you're getting, let's say, five times, four times your investment, and you're off by a factor of two, you're getting two times your money back. So, so it's, it's sort of living in the ambiguity and it's okay to be wrong, or, or, or like you know within a framework. You just don't want to be completely wrong outside of the, uh, outside of the fences. So I do think it's a little bit of a cultural like it's it's uncertainty and, and, and imperfect information, and dealing with ambiguity. It's that's okay, especially in the early stage, because like I said, you can be off by a couple factors and still make money. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, so the, I didn't have to the, I think your question about the Japanese large company buying US startup company, I think there's many cases happen, but it, I think 99% 90, has failed. And I think mostly it's because of the culture difference and that, uh, you know, many cases uh, you have to pay more than a CEO back in Japan here. Yeah, and uh, it, they cannot accept that. So uh, how are you going to wave on that and then try to come out the idea and the incentive? And then you cannot really give the Japanese company stock as an incentive too, because which doesn't really do much too. So it's a very, very difficult question. But it, I think the Japanese company has to solve it. Otherwise, uh, I see a lot of Chinese and uh, Korean companies buying company left to right, and they're giving a quite very incentive and challenge to them. And I think that could be a challenge for the Japanese company. 
I think from my perspective is that as you may probably know, uh, Japanese uh, established companies, I would say, uh, are facing uh, the reality that they, they need new products to sell or technology or innovation. So they, they don't they they have to look some opportunities outside. So uh, they are facing this uh, problem and they have to change their mind. That's that's uh, that's uh, been uh, discussed in in, in, uh, in Japan and many well known established oil companies are now looking outside. So I'm hoping that it will change. Uh, my name is Sachin Mittal. So, my name is Sachin Mittal, and I focus on very breakthrough technologies in US introduced to Japanese companies. I want to ask many companies, including Panasonic, Sony, Hara, we have kind of venture capitalist or technology scouts here. Is that model working, or is that still insufficient? Uh, <laughs> 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 I mean, I think there are some people from here. <laughs> I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think there are some success. I don't know what's the measure of success. Uh, maybe that's the way to understand uh, how the Silicon Valley works, and hopefully that's report back to the corporate and the headquarters. People start to change some mind and understanding the. Silicon Valley culture, um, but in terms of, it, I mean, I know there are some of the uh, corporate venture capital from Japan has been financially successful, but it strategically successful. That's kind of doubtful. I mean, that uh, has been an issue there. Uh, other speakers, right? Uh, maybe it's more Japanese. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, as far as I understand, yes, uh, on top of what Mr. Sans have mentioned, yeah, there, there, there are companies making investments through venture capital funds, but uh, not just looking for a uh, financial return, but also looking for strategic uh, opportunities. So uh, there, there are moving some, for, I don't know, I would say for the past one, 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 two years or so. So something is moving. So, next question. Yes, could the panel please comment on the effect of crowdfunding? And perhaps not many people know that just within the past 24 hours, the Securities and Exchange Commission has put some new rules in place to become effective in June, which will make it a little bit easier for companies to raise higher levels of money. And I, I pose the question to the crowd, uh, to the panel rather, has crowdfunding thus far had any significant effect on the types of companies that we're here to talk about tonight? Um, and do you anticipate with greater access to capital that perhaps maybe even some of the venture capitalists will start to feel a uh, little bit of competitive biting at their heels now? Yeah, actually, I, I did not know that, but I will say the um, it, it's it's already highly competitive. I mean, with, with all the cash on the balance sheets of the corporates, with the mandates for the PEs and the BCs to make investments, it's highly competitive, and we see that reflected in the price. I think with the crowdfunding, I'm not sure if it's going to maybe change the competitive dynamic. As much as it is, it's going to give people access to a market they never had before, right? So someone like myself, I don't, I am not a millionaire, but I might want to play that game, right? And so through crowdfunding. I guess the other side is, is you might get a lot um, I'll call it less smart money in the room, and, and and that could be sort of also that could be that could, it could be good or it could be bad, right? It could be an, an opportunity to arbitrage, um, or it could drive up prices artificially and creating a bubble. So it's it's yet to see how that plays out. I think crowdfunding has been successful in real estate. It'll be successful in other areas, but the first thing or maybe the second thing the, the venture capital looks for is the cap table. And if it's got more than a handful of shareholders and, and a lot of footnotes, they're done. I mean, they're not going to waste their time with that. So if you start out with crowdfunding as your first financing source, you're probably not going to get venture capital. I'll, I'll defer to the experts, but my experience, even with 
companies that only have 20 shareholders, and venture capitalists are like, forget that. That's just too many. And crowdfunding, remember, you're going to end up with hundreds of shareholders, not, not 20. You're going to end up with hundreds of shareholders. It's not good for the tech model, I don't think. Um, but I think it, it, it will work in other fields, but not, not Silicon Valley tech model, I don't think. Yeah, I agree with Dennis. Um, um, yeah, I just don't want to see the cap people like that. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Gentlemen uh, over there? Thank you. Question, the very, uh, very first slide showing a, a m and versus IPO. Uh, a question, uh, it's kind of a uh, first question is, uh, is the same trend true in Japan? <coughs> yeah. So, uh, yes, seven day has been gradually increasing. Uh, it's about 60% at the moment, as I mentioned. So uh, some people say that we, Japan, Japanese, the, the situation in Japan is 30 years later compared to what has happened in the U.S. <laughs> so maybe you're somewhere around here. <laughs> and I'm hoping, or, or many people saying that at least we are trying to increase more M&As to give uh, opportunities uh, for earlier exits. And uh, my, as I mentioned at the front, uh, my, one of my concerns is how we can do that in Japan, how we can be sent to this, uh, uh, like, like, so how we can incorporate, how we can learn from a Silicon Valley model. But, uh, yes, in, a, in order to answer your question, the direction is like this, so the front side down. M&A is increasing, but not that uh, quickly. So we are still you know, around 1990s and 2000. That's the situation. Well, we keep working for 30 more years. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a second uh, question related to that. So, uh, if for the increase in the M&A, uh, what type of companies are doing the acquiring of Japanese startups? Are they domestic? Uh, venture funds or uh, companies coming from outside Japan? And what, what kind of uh, acquiring is happening? Yeah, yeah. Both, both ways, as, as I mentioned, for example, Google has acquired Shaft, which is a Japanese venture company. I think it only had uh, two or three years of corporate history. But on the other hand, Japanese companies are also buying Japanese venture, venture under, uh, early stage startup companies. So it's both ways. Uh, but the difference would be uh, it's uh, the age of, uh, I don't know, there's no, pro there's no border, so uh, foreign companies can easily acquire a Japanese company, they may find, quite easily find opportunities in Japan, so I think more, more uh, out-in type of transaction would be could increase for, for this upcoming uh, years. That's uh, my personal view. Any speakers would like to add something on that? Or maybe this is unique to me. I don't know. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's starting increasing more in Monday in Japan too. Uh, it's good things in the last one, two years. I, I think Asakura san here can speak more too. Okay. Is, uh, a lot of the internet, uh, internet companies, public companies buying a startup company in Japan as well. So that hasn't happened before. And so it's a good trend to happening. Uh, so hopefully, increase more. Thank you, Nixon. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, Sabrina, some please. Hi, I'm Yusuke Sakura. Uh, I'd like to know more about you know talent retention. So in general, uh, does uh, U.S. companies expect? Uh, say, talents a startup uh, stays inside the company. Because I myself sold my company, and as a sales side, I try to shorten key person protection, protection period, because nobody wants to stay longer. 
And actually, every colleague except me left the company after team of protection. And uh, as vice president, I bought more than five companies, and I always had a hard time to let people stay inside the company. So here in the yeah, Silicon Valley, there are made so many CEO entrepreneurs, but uh, that means the person leave, will leave the company. So if you judge the company or evaluate the company based on the talent, it doesn't make sense. So I'd like to know how uh, companies here in Bay Area be assured that they can product, uh, they can product keep talents inside. It's a tough challenge. I mean, the biggest challenge in all M and A is the integration of the two companies after the deal is done. Unfortunately, us lawyers, we're done with it and we go home. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, <laughs> the other people have to worry about that. Uh, no, it is, it is very challenging because I think that if you don't feel part of the new culture, if you don't feel that your services are valued, if you're intellectually challenged, if you don't feel that you're part of that, then yes, you probably do want to leave and you probably have enough resources to leave. Where a lot of people initially have to work because they need the money, they need to pay the rent, the mortgage, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I think, you know, there's very creative ways. I mean, I think some of these compensation plans, half of it is tied to the performance of the company as a whole, especially if you're a public company, you want the stock to do well, you want everyone to help each other, and maybe half of it's tied to your own performance or your group's performance or your division's performance and things like that. So I think there's creative ways to do that. But, you know, Silicon Valley is built on stock options. I mean, that's where the wealth is created. It's not created with the cash. It's not created with the perks. It's created with the stock options. And if people don't want stock options, or they don't think this, the stock is going to go up and their options are going to be worth anything, you know, I mean, a lot of people don't remember, but, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we had to reprice all the stock options because everything was underwater and you couldn't retain people because they, there was no value in the stock options. There was a lot of accounting issues with that, a lot of tax issues with that. You know, someday that'll come back. But a lot of people don't even remember that we had a, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we had a recession and stock was not worth anything, stock options were negative. Um, and, and that's the, the bread and butter of Silicon Valley. It will always be the bread and butter of Silicon Valley. And any other tech environment, it's about the stock options. And that's the main way to re retain people. Uh, if that goes away, I don't think there's any other way to really do that other than the intangibles of, of culture and intellectual stimulation and conquering the world. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's a very difficult question, and uh, but one of the things somehow it's the two years is the, the year that the people expecting to at least stick around. And uh, if you don't, I mean, if you get a, a big retention bonus, and if you don't stay with the company for two years, say like Google or something like that, then it, you will be a, a kind of the black mark for the next venture when you start a company, um, maybe you don't get the same offer anymore because you, you didn't stay that with the uh, acquirer for two years. So that kind of information can fly around quite easily around here. So in a way, if you sold a company and if you get a good cash and if you get a good stock option, stay there for two years and uh, at night time building your own company, <laughs> <laughs> after two years you already have a product. And, uh, <laughs> I think many people are doing that. Uh. I guess the comment I made, I'd make about that is if you're the buyer, you need to identify something that the employees at the target want and they're going to value. That may not be money, that may not be stock options, that may not be free food. It might be something along the lines of creative freedom to continue to run the business. But as a buyer, you need to decide how much of that freedom you're going to give them that's going to work for you. Hey, Greg, on that, and, and I, I've seen companies do this in the past, and I don't know if you see this, but they'll, they, they'll hire someone and they'll say, after two years, we will allow you, you know, to, use of our lab to work on your own products one day a week, right? So it's still good because, you know, they, they, they're creative and they want to explore new opportunities. So you give them that sort of freedom to do that, and whatever they do, they own, but you know, the Monday through Thursday, what they do in that lab Monday through Thursday is the, the rights of the, of the company. And you give them that sort of flexibility, I think that might be a way to help 
them sort of fulfill their appetite to, to develop and explore and solve problems at the same time stay motivated in their current employer. You know? Next question. Gentleman uh, over there. My name is Kota Kizawa. I'm working for NATO, a government related agency. My question is as a government officer, I really appreciate if you can give us the advice to increase the early startups purchased by Japanese large companies. <laughs> Any other recommendation? 30 seconds. <laughs> I know these guys don't want to say it, but they're dying to say it. I always tell government, stay out of our way. No, just kidding. Silicon <laughs> <laughs> Valley hates regulations. They, just, they really want to have the freedom to change the world, and that, that's part of it. So, I mean, I think on the definitely don't want regulations, but if you can give incentives, you know, you can incentivize people. Part of it's in the tax system. I know we don't want to bore you with taxes, but, you know, one of the challenges for the sellers is. Everything they get as part of the purchase price in the U.S. is capital gains. It's a very low tax rate. So again, to the extent you can encourage capital investments and capital gains and have any input on the tax side of it, that's a good thing. Um, now, a lot of time we talk about incentivizing people and keeping them on with these bonuses and other things like that. In the U.S., that's ordinary income. That's taxed at two or three times the capital gains. So there's that tension because a lot of the buyers want to incentivize and they want to expense that, they want to deduct that expense, where the sellers, they want capital gains, they want the money to be purchase price, even on an earn out, they want that to be purchase price, they don't want it tied to employment, they just want it tied to time, you know, and they want a lot of that stuff, so to the extent you have any input on the tax side, that's a good way to do it, but incentivizing jobs, I mean, a lot of the stimulus is about jobs, so it probably creates so many jobs without the government, it's not focused, but other parts of the U.S., the job creation is a big part. Texas is doing a, an, you know, an incredible job of stealing our companies out of California by giving them a lot of incentives. Low tax rates, low regulations, and that's maybe a way. If you can give low regulations and low tax rates, some companies may, may consider that. Probably not from Silicon Valley, but maybe other parts of the U.S. Would you like to make a comment on that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, pay higher price. <laughs> so if Japanese company acquires some startup here, maybe Japanese government match up with that. <laughs> and maybe that's the way. I, I don't know. I think the culture thing is important. Maybe actually the biggest thing that Actually, to me, the biggest thing is that education. Uh, Japanese company uh, do a much better job in terms of the education the employee to the more like global idea, so that they'll understand much more and better and willing to work with a startup in the US. I think that's key. And uh, improve in English as well. <laughs> I was thinking about this uh, in the plane. Uh, over the past few days, I just want to make my one quick personal comment on that. Is uh, I think we should welcome venture capitalists to, to Japan. That's that's in short. That's my uh, short answer. Uh, I'm thinking about, for example, baseball players. In the past and maybe this is a very long example, but baseball baseball players or <coughs> how to make sushi. It, it's not just a big, It's not just. A, learning on books. You have to, it's not, it's some kind of art. I, I, that's what I, I'm feeling. So uh, it's not learning the mathematics or, or, or how to evaluate or that kind of thing. It's, it's just an art. So someone must come and show, because we, have, we already have people, money, technology, maybe you no know, English, but uh, we, we, we have those elements and what we are lacking is uh, someone uh, who shows the way how we can uh, grow up those things. But, and I think it's like baseball, maybe 20, 30 years ago, when I was a, a school kid, I was watching on TV, many major league baseball players came to Japan, and that's how Japanese people started going abroad, like Ichiro and other major league baseball players. So it's not just technology, uh, learning, 
what, how, may, how, uh, what, how to grip, etc. Those are the small things, but it's the important thing is someone to show how uh, it should be the real person. Sushi is also, for example, it's not uh, rice bowl with uh, raw fish on it. It's uh, it, someone must come sushi. Uh, I'm not thinking talking about uh, California roll, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> some real sushi uh, experts should come from Ginza to uh, abroad and show what the real sushi is, and it may inspire someone, and it may grow up. Uh, the college, and that's what I was thinking about. So maybe my short answer again is to invite many uh, Silicon Valley venture capitalists to Japan. That's my short answer. Thank you.